Mary Shelley's Frankenstein remains a cultural icon, with her gothic novel finding greater recognition in other mediums than the original novel. Just years after its publication, Shelley's story enjoyed popularity on stage and became embedded in the public's imagination, including allusions in Dickens' Great Expectations and as an effective metaphor for political cartoons. Frankenstein enjoyed a revival in the early 20th century, largely fueled by cinema. Since then, the story of Frankenstein has been seen in film, television, politics, cartoons, and a number of other areas, including comic books. The Frankenstein monster appeared in Prize Comics in 1940, believed to be the first ongoing horror comic book series in the United States. Set in contemporary America, the Frankenstein monster was depicted as cruel and vengeful after being spurned by humanity, paralleling his literary counterpart. Over time, Dr. Frankenstein recruited one of the monster's victims, transforming him into a superhero. This led to a number of battles, including what is believed to be one of comic book's first superhero team-ups. The monster was referred to as Frankenstein, not the first time this happened. Eventually rehabilitated, the monster battled Nazis in Europe, fighting alongside his former foes against the greater evil. Prize Comics' depiction of Frankenstein's monster fighting Nazis during World War II shares parallels with the Soviet Union allying against the Nazis, including the monster's eventual reversion to an enemy. This depiction provides an opportunity to examine society's beliefs concerning rehabilitation and the timeless trope of fighting fire with fire, or here, monster versus monster. This film uses narrative criticism to analyze the artifacts in Prize Comics Frankenstein stories. Narrative can be an effective means of rhetoric because of its ability to draw its audience into the writer's world and worldview, in this case the Allies fight against the Nazis. Here, the comic book world creates a familiar scene for readers, a battle between heroes and villains, then inserts something uncommon for the genre, a reformed villain fighting alongside the heroes. This narrative invites the reader to make a personal judgment on the value of questionable allies and links it with the story's historical context, i.e. World War II. The narrative's objective is to legitimize using whatever means necessary to win a war against perceived evil, even if it requires working alongside evil. Examining the Frankenstein monster's reformation and role as an ally allows a look at shifting cultural attitudes concerning reformation of criminals, and how a writer's narrative is used to support an alliance with a morally compromised individual. Rhetorical criticism analyzes the symbolic artifacts of discourse. The words, phrases, images, gestures, performances, texts, films, etc. that people use to communicate. Rhetorical analysis shows how the artifacts work, how well they work, and how the artifacts as discourse inform and instruct, entertain and arouse, and convince and persuade the audience. Narratives are a form of rhetoric where people can relate to something and form an opinion based on their assessment of whether they agree with the story being told. According to Sonia Foss, narratives organize the stimuli of our experience so that we can make sense of the people, places, events, and actions of our lives. They allow us to interpret reality because they help us decide what a particular experience is about and how the various elements of our experience are connected. Narratives can be a powerful form of rhetoric because of how deeply they can draw in their audience. Narrative criticism will be used to analyze the narrative and the artifact, the comic book prize comics number 33. This analysis will explain why the artifact qualifies as a narrative, then determine the narrative's objective. Next, the analysis will show the narrative elements that meet the narrative's objective of questioning whether criminals can be reformed and the use of evil to fight evil. The Frankenstein Monster, hereafter called Frankenstein, debuted in Prize Comics number 7 
in 1940. Frankenstein was one of several features in Prize, and this feature showed Frankenstein's rampage across America as Dr. Frankenstein tried to capture and destroy him. Prize Comics number 33 introduced Dr. Carroll, a noble scientist who sees good in Frankenstein and wants to reform him in order to put his superhuman physicality to use in war production. A reluctant police chief agrees to the plan, provided Frankenstein is captured, an unlikely event given previous failures. However, the U.S. Army succeeds, bringing Frankenstein to justice. Frankenstein is then put on trial, with the state arguing for his destruction. Dr. Carroll pleads with the judge, pointing out the judge wouldn't kill a sick dog if it could be cured. The judge relents, giving Dr. Carroll a probationary period to reform the monster. Dr. Carroll takes the monster, reforming him with a mixture of hypnotherapy and corrective plastic surgery. Now reformed, Frankenstein is eager to help humanity fight the Nazis. An artifact must qualify as a narrative before narrative criticism can be employed. A narrative can be found among artifacts in storytelling media, such as novels, films, plays, and comic books. Narratives can also be found in other rhetoric, such as speeches, paintings, and dreams. Whatever the rhetoric, there are four requirements for rhetorical form to be a narrative. One, it must have at least two events. Two, the events must have some type of temporal structure. Three, the events must have a causal or contributing connection. And four, it should concern a unified subject. An examination of the artifact will demonstrate it meets these requirements. First, the artifact contains several events. The artifact fulfills the requirement of temporal structure. As Voss notes, a narrative is not simply a series of events arranged randomly. It is at least a sequence of events. This story has a straightforward timeline with the scientists discussing the potential to save Frankenstein. Frankenstein's capture, Frankenstein's trial, and Frankenstein's reformation. The story ends with Frankenstein's apparent rehabilitation. The narrative also meets the requirement of causal relations. The events must have a causal or contributing connection. Here, Dr. Carroll feels he can reform Frankenstein. Frankenstein is subsequently captured, and Dr. Carroll not only successfully fights for Frankenstein's life, but reforms him. Finally, a narrative must have a unified subject. While there are several characters who play significant roles in the story, the narrative focuses on Frankenstein. He is essential because he is perceived as an irredeemable monster, except by Dr. Carroll, who proves there is redemption in him, suggesting evil can be transformed into good. A narrative can be an excellent means of rhetoric because of its ability to draw its audience into the writer's world and worldview. Sonia Foss writes, The narrated world that is created in a story involves participants because the world is particular, shareable, and personal. Here, writer-artist Dick Briefer uses a comic book world to create a familiar scene for readers, Frankenstein on a Rampage, and shows transformation from enemy to ally. The narrative's objective is to legitimize reformation of the most undesirables in an effort to win a war. The narrative challenges a reader who is used to seeing Frankenstein as an irredeemable monster and who becomes an ally in World War II. A narrative can use a variety of elements to accomplish its objective, including characters, events, setting, theme, the narrator, causal relations, and what type of story the narrative happens to be. There are several characters in the story, but the most important are Dr. Carroll and the Judge. They are central to the narrative's objective of suggesting that redemption is possible. Dr. Carroll and the Judge represent contrasting views on dealing with violence, while Frankenstein provides proof that redemption is possible. The Judge. The Judge represents society and is the arbiter of whether Frankenstein will be destroyed or reformed. Initially set on destroying Frankenstein, the judge changes his mind after Dr. Carroll persuades him to give Frankenstein a chance at rehabilitation. The judge represents society's ability to change accepted standards of who should be given a chance to reform. Frankenstein Frankenstein serves two roles here. 
First, he acts as a traditional villain who plagues society, here destroying a railroad car, and represents the destructive force of evil. Second, Frankenstein represents the potential of reformation. Frankenstein has been shown as evil throughout his run in the comic book, so this departure offers a marked change in direction. Frankenstein's embrace of redemption is important to showing how even the most evil person can be reformed. The Police Chief The Police Chief represents authority and the arm of society charged with protecting it. The Army The Army is an important character because it does what no one has been able to do before, bring Frankenstein to justice. The Army's role, while small, serves to glorify it serving a propaganda purpose as well, arguably hinting it will destroy the monster of the Axis powers eventually. A narrative's events are crucial to determining whether it meets its objective. According to Foss, major events in the story are called kernels. These are events that suggest critical points in the narrative and that force movement in particular directions. They cannot be left out of a narrative without destroying its coherence and meaning. Minor plot events, called satellites, are the development or working out of the choices made at the kernels. Their function is to fill out, elaborate, and complete the kernels. Satellites are not crucial to the narrative, and can be deleted without disturbing the basic storyline of the narrative. Narrative criticism involves an analysis of the kernels and satellites to determine if the narrative's objective is being met. For example, in kernel number one, Dr. Carroll discusses the possibility and potential of rehabilitating Frankenstein. In Colonel 2, Frankenstein is captured. In Colonel number 3, Frankenstein is put on trial. Satellite number 1, related to Colonel number 3, sees the judge ordering Frankenstein to be destroyed. Satellite number 2, related to Colonel number 3, sees Dr. Carroll defending Frankenstein. The next satellite sees Frankenstein seemingly going to attack Dr. Carroll, only to instead call him friend. The last satellite related to Colonel 3 sees the judge put Frankenstein on probation. These kernels and satellites help with analyzing the narrative process. Temporal Relations A narrative's use of time can affect whether it meets its objective by keying the reader's attention to what is important. This story is told in chronological order. The story compresses time as the army hunts Frankenstein. Frankenstein's trial takes up the crux of the story, and time is compressed to show the long process of Frankenstein's rehabilitation. Causal Relations There are four causal events tied to the narrative's objective. One is the quest to rehabilitate Frankenstein. The second is Frankenstein's capture. The third is his trial. The fourth is his rehabilitation. Ultimately, Frankenstein is rehabilitated. Narrator Comic books often feature omniscient and omnipresent narrators who are capable of showing the characters' actions and inner thoughts. The narrator in Frankenstein is omnipresent but not omniscient. The narrator describes the action without opinion. Only at the end does the narrator invite the reader to question whether Frankenstein will stay rehabilitated leaving it to the reader to look to the next issue. Audience The audience is a comic book reader who reads about superheroes, and in this story, villains. What makes the audience helpful in this narrative is their being accustomed to reading about Frankenstein as a menace with little or no hope of redemption. The audience then sees there is hope for redemption, and that in precarious situations such as wartime, it is worth taking a chance if a formidable ally can be found. The narrative has two themes. One, that desperate times call for desperate measures, and two, that reformation of even the most callous individuals is possible. Type of story. The type of story found in a narrative can help it meet its objective. Here the story type is a romance, and as we shall see, it is an ideal type for the narrative to meet its objective. Foss notes, in a romance, which does not always have to involve love, the protagonist completes a quest against an enemy and emerges victorious and enlightened. Here we have Dr. Carroll resolve to reform Frankenstein, despite the public's call for Frankenstein's destruction. Dr. Carroll makes his case and succeeds in reaching out to Frankenstein's good nature. He 
then reforms him. This type of story is well suited for the narrative to reach its objective because it shows how a previously villainous character can be reformed. The generic setting of somewhere in the United States during World War II is important for showing the themes of desperation and redemption. The United States is engaged in war production and Frankenstein interferes with it, making the situation worse. The monster must either be destroyed or rehabilitated in order for the nation to focus on winning a war. This analysis is important to rhetorical criticism because it examines how a normally villainous character can contribute to the narrative meeting its objective in a world normally envisioned in moral absolutes. Frankenstein's appearances in Fry's comics depicted him as a pure villain up until this story, with no hope of reformation or any desire on his behalf to do so. This stark contrast raises the importance of reformation as well as the necessity of working with someone who is once considered an enemy. This narrative also shows that desperate times call for desperate measures and that reformation is possible, although dangerous. Thanks to the nature of this narrative being shared and personal, writer Dick Briefer can introduce a character and allow the reader to form their own opinion as to whether reformation is possible and necessary, particularly during times of war. Narratives are personal to each member of the audience, but this narrative is persuasive that wartime can make for strange alliances. It also raises questions for further analysis such as the power of reformation, the idea of criminals serving as soldiers, the Soviet Union as an unlikely ally during World War II, and whether reformed criminals or questionable allies will revert to their villainous natures.